Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, today we're having uh, is uh, July 14th, uh, the Clean Weekly Network Call. Uh, this is the uh, uh, still stunning that we have weekly calls in the Clean Network since 2008. I don't know of anybody else who's done that. It's pretty stunning. And uh, the, the way I love to think about it is we have so many people working and so much to talk about as we, as we do this work together uh, that we've been able to fill. I, I'd like to know how many, mon how many Tuesdays at one o'clock that is. It's probably calculated. I just don't do it on the fly, but it's been a lot. Um, but anyway, so uh, I'm Frank Niepold. I'm the uh, clean co-chair and today I'm uh, pinch hitting for Jen Kretzer. Uh, I'll be your facilitator today. We're having an informal conversation. So um, the way we usually like to start that off is announcements. Um, and if you also have topics that you think we should be exploring together, um, that's also fine. And let's always remember we, we're being recorded. So um, there are plenty of people who actually listen to these recordings. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, we're not just speaking to ourselves. We're also speaking to people beyond who couldn't make this time. So announcements and or topics. Let's start with announcements first. Um, I have an announcement. I can start. This is Katie Boyd. I'm the Clean Program Manager. And I just wanted to let everyone know that um, AGU is going to be mostly virtual and somewhat uh, some local organization this year is what they're thinking um, right now for AGU. And so um, they're still accepting um, abstracts and things like that for the um, sessions, mostly going to be virtual meeting, however. But if you're interested in joining and attending, this might be a good year to do it since you can do it from everywhere. Um, so uh, I just put in the um, chat a link to all the different climate literacy sessions that, that Clean is sort of trying to facilitate or, or sponsor or what have you. So um, we have some on um, higher education and and broad communication um, and K through 12 youth groups and other um, focuses. So um, take a look at those and see if you can um, add any uh, work into the, our AGU sessions. Thanks everyone. And, and Katie, just to be clear for all of us who are uh, in this COVID time, finding ourselves more busy than ever, uh, when are these abstracts due? Oh, that's a good question. 29th, I think, of July. That's what I remember. Yeah, July. I am currently it's... authoring mine for session 09 of H. <laughs> ah, the Yay. showcase. Perfect. Um, yeah, let me double check the date here. I, um, it's usually I think, I think the end of right. July or beginning of August. It's July 29th. You were correct. You were correct. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. So, uh, yep. That's uh, and and when you just to clarify, Katie, when you say, uh, uh, here, uh, let's put the. Can we put the link back in? Because uh, Deb probably got in here after, uh, you put that link. It's all right, Deb. I got you. Um, so uh, I think she's asking for. Well, here's the link that I put in. These are to the AGU. Um, this is what actually literacy. Is there. I just searched for climate literacy, and 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 that usually pulls up our. And then the clean actual AGU document planning document we were working in. I can share the link to that in one awesome. second. Awesome. Awesome. But but uh, just to clarify, and maybe maybe somebody else knows when you say mostly virtual, uh, what's that? That's what they've said. That's how that's I how think AGU has built it in terms of, um, I think there's going to be some like view watch parties that may happen locally for folks to be able to get together, but that's on a more local basis. And I think the conference itself is still all mostly happening virtually in terms of the presentations and posters and things like that. Wendy, does that sound what you, you seem does to that know? that sound like what, how you understood what they said, Wendy? Well, Yes. For anyone else. So from a, from a conference planner perspective, when you have contracts and you're inside a year, you have to play chicken <laughs> with the convention centers and hotels about what you're doing in order to try to not say you're canceling before they cancel on you or you get stuck with penalties. Uh, I see. So they're, they're, they're based, they're, they're, so if, if a state does something that says you cannot do this, then they're, they're not, um, breaking the contract. 
because they weren't able to fulfill it. I got you. Thank you. Interesting. Yep. And along with it, if one looks at the Moscone Center convention schedule right now, AGU is listed. So that that's consistent with what you all are just saying. That uh, no, we haven't quit. You know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what they did say in the email I saw was that that they may have folks you know, at Moscone Center, even doing like some networking events or watch parties or whatever, they said, depending on, you know, COVID and then other regional groups would do similar things in other areas. So. I got you. Uh, yeah, right. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> Reality just does not look like that's happening. All right. Well, that's if great. Okay, uh, could I ask you a question yeah, around ADU? Please. Yeah. Is that right? Um, yeah, go ahead. Is, is this right or, or what's more right? Uh, uh, late is it later in the process when there typically would be your submitting for posters there's that making choices with the larger of all of us in mind right when you submit a poster you're not only getting something you want to put out as a poster but you're you're convincing AGU that there needs to be this section of posters that there needs to be sessions you know there's interest in this subject from many different places so you're, you know you're contribute you know you're making strategic choices to fit into that it, 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 would we say that's or, or we're, that's later in the year we're not mm. we're not there yet or with the sessions no, is there something we should do with that yeah, go ahead, Katie. Yeah, th this is the time to do that, Jim, exactly. So the posters are included as well as the oral presentations in this timing abstract submission um, at right. the end of the month. So yes, please include your poster. If you want it to be showcased in our very specifically poster session um, that we build, you know, to really highlight climate change education initiatives and projects, um, I just put in, gosh, and all my links are now running together. Um, I just put in the link to that specific session. It's Education 009, um, as yeah. Wendy said, she was submitting something there. Yay, thank you, Wendy. Um, so Jim, uh, that would be the probably good place for you to submit. I think that's where you had submitted your poster last year as well, and I would do that before July 29th. And Great, just, and it's just put something ahead, in that general area. Um, if there's if anything comes up like, hey, gee, if I could have this uh, angle to it, that'll really help us to be noticed by taking seriously age you. Of course, we all want to do that. Yeah, I think just even having the session helps with that because we can show, like you were saying, how many folks have interest in, and such. And so there's the abstract for the session there that you can try to kind of tie some of your language into the language of the abstract, which helps us sort of you know, show that the posters are relevant to our session as conveners. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's just sort of a short blurb about your work and project that you want to showcase on a poster. So, and, and Jim, just to note that three of the conveners of 009 are on this call as we speak. Uh, that'd be uh, Deb, myself, and Katie. So the only person missing of the convening who actually are the ones who decide posters, oral sessions, and all that stuff um, is Anna Gold and. Uh, you know, so just uh, we're all we're all we're all in the family here. So, uh, but I, I take I take Katie's point about connecting the the, the language and the focus. Um, but that's that's easy. Uh -huh. uh, one one other technical point that might be helpful given this virtual reality that we're looking forward at AGU and other conferences is um, I'm assuming that there's going to be a registration cost. Um, do we know if that registration cost is lower? I think it will be. At least in terms of the abstracts, didn't they say that they had reduced the, the fee for the abstract cost? I read that somewhere now. I can't remember if that's true. Does anyone else know? They haven't yeah. said anything about the registration, but based the, on what I saw meeting. about the abstracts, I'm thinking it's going to be similar. But I, okay. I got you. I, I can add that the AMS model is going to be a lower kind of participation fee for. Gotcha. Okay. That's great. Uh, that'll help with getting more people in our community to actually participate in AGU uh, and, and really doing that conference inside a conference um, thing that we've been doing with Clean for a long time with AGU. So, uh, but that, that, that fee is, if you're not an educator, that fee is pretty hefty. So, uh, all right, cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, Can I other... throw one other thing into that conversation too? And sure. I think Frank, Frank has his hand up too. Oh, it says it right here, actually. Sorry, can I jump in really quick before we no, go to that? Um, this, just because it's on this abstract fee. Um, it says it will be, the registration fee will be about 50% less than the in-person rate and lower for graduate students and other groups. Um, so 
yeah, they're anticipating about a 50% reduction in the registration fee, Frank. Okay. And then Frank Grantoff, please. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I think you covered the bases on that one. I was just going to mention that Pernodi, um, um, edu um, Earth ed Educators Rendezvous is going on this week. And Pernodi Asher, Ashner is one of the people in that. And I'm hoping to bump into her. And I was going to say I could ask her about that, but it sounds like you may have answered the question. Yeah, I just found the language on the AGO abstract submission site. I was I had seen part of the virtual EER for three hours yesterday, and I have several hours tomorrow afternoon with a session. So, and previously, prior to COVID and virtual life, I was going to be unable to participate at all because we would be running a course and I couldn't be in two places at one day. But in this life, you can be wherever you need to be all the time. Problem <laughs> <laughs> with that one, Wendy. <laughs> um, so related to the the whole sort of discussion of the, uh, the Jim is talking about about um, abstract submission. So one of the things that I really kind of want to push all of us on as leaders in this space is like, who do we know that doesn't know how to navigate AGU? but that work is important to be heard in that space. And how can we reach out to partner with those folks to be able to submit something for AGU? Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's a really key move to get some of the things that are actually in the practitioner sort of space of the world lifted a little bit more and maybe even as a seed to start writing something together to get it into the research record. So I kind of want to push us all on that. Great point, Deb. Uh, I think, you know, maybe maybe we could. Uh, I mean, the 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 thing to do. It, I mean, the big barrier is should I? And there's a cost, and should I spend that money, right? So there's there's there's, and why why what's the value proposition of doing it? What what are you? Well, how adding? can we pay for those people? Well, that's like, what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah. if we can remove the financial one, and then then they they even know about it. But then the third one is. Why would they go to the effort of doing it here? It's a strange, strange thing that the climate literacy conference is inside of AGU. It's just the way it is. Uh, mm -hmm. It just kind of organically happened. Um, so uh, I think that that you know we'll have to talk about. I think maybe we should write something that describes. I don't even know how many years we've been doing this, um, but it's been a long time. Uh, it's I think ten years at least, uh, where we've been kind of co-opting a section of the, the AGU conference just using the climate literacy colon. Uh -huh. um, it's a simple tool, but it, it's been very effective for us as a community. So there might be a, like, what's the, the benefit of, or the contribution that you're doing? So uh -huh. I don't know, if, you, if you think there's value there, maybe we just need to write something a little yeah, small. There's, there's probably like a one pager to be able to go out with to collaborators and say like, what is this, what is the value proposition for you? You know, okay. and that's something I've had to do lately with the tribal collaborations in Washington state. And um, I think it, really important that we actually are able to communicate why there's value for folks right. to actually come into power spaces that are largely white, often hostile, <laughs> like, like the, that we need to really communicate like what the value proposition is for them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And to be Go ahead, Katie. I was just going to say, yeah, and I think I always struggle with that because so much of the value of clean is what people bring into it and take out of it themselves, you know, and so like it is a struggle to kind of like break that down because it's different for each different person that comes, you know, and how they interact with clean in different ways and things like that. And I mean, I'll just say I'm now, you know, really more fo focal and central, you know, as a clean program manager in this space, but I spent, you know, almost 10 years kind of as a, what you might call a lurker, just kind of <laughs> watching the email lists and not really like, you know, in engaging in the conversations just because I couldn't on Tuesdays and things like that, you know, so right. um, I think, I think it's a really good point, Deb. I think it's a great idea and I think we should definitely definitely have some sort of one pager and I think we can do it. I'm just like throwing out there that I always struggle with that a little bit of like, you know, how do we kind of break that into sort of a short description for folks, but I think Emily, it could probably help because sure. you've been here for so long. <laughs> yeah, sure. Happy. But uh, Emily, you had, a, you had a point you wanted to add to this. Well, no, just I think that it's a very, very important point, you know, because I'm trying to do some interdisciplinary stuff between groups that have no idea what AGU is. Right. Right. And, um, you know, with people who are professionals in their own niches, um, but trying to bridge that gap in both directions, it is 
it is, these are barriers, the financial barriers of one of them. And I think you're right about the having a description in place so that they understand that them participating in this space is going to help them with their bigger goals. Um, I, I think that those are both really important points. So I, I would love to see a system for that. That would be really helpful for me. Sure. And I think this is the year to do it because of the virtual and the cost. Um, I mean, this, this is the year, if we're ever going to break past some of these, these normal silos, this would be the time. So a great point. Uh, it's, you know, 16. Is there any more to add to this? Jim, do you have a point to make? Yeah, one more question. This is actually sparked by something you brought up, Frank, um, about costs. Um, our group or, you know, who we are is quite legitimately many different entities altogether, right? We're quite, we're, we're children, we're students, we're K-12, we're university. If AGU has different cost levels for different types of organizations, there can be, you know, I mean, maybe it's just being aware that, hey, look, if a K-12 school is the one who puts in for something and a federal government agency takes advantage of that, that's not cheating. It's, it's sort of set up that way. In any case, I'm just saying, you know, I want to be aware of that, that we, we have that if it can be strategically, okay, these are the ones who put in for the money and we're all together. You know, just if anyone's got a high cost, I think at least I, I would be quite willing to, to uh, listen to, hey, we can keep your costs down and we're not cheating. This is, this is legitimate. No, I agree. Point. I, mean, I think we can definitely, a lot of people don't know about that, that, you know, if you're an educator, you don't pay. Um, uh, clause on how to do it. I think that would be important. I don't know if there's other categories that are don't have to pay the, the registration fee. I think they have to pay the abstract fee though. Am I right in that? Everyone has to pay the ab abstract fee. Yeah, I think you yeah, still have, yeah, that, you I mean, still have to was, pay the that, abstract fee. That was fee. like $70 or something, I think, last yeah. year, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's still a bit much for some folks, but yeah, yep. it's you have to pay the abstract fee, but not the registration fee, correct? Okay. So do, I think we're good. Um, so Katie, why don't you and I and, and Patrick touch base on the backside of this uh, call and, and see if we can put something together to start the, the process. I, very, I, think, I like that thumb, Patrick. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let's not go crazy with the thumbs, guys. Uh, so uh, the um, other topics. Thank you. Or other announcements. I don't think we yeah, actually yeah, yeah. took Other announcements. Now. Sorry. They, yeah, we kind of got on the discussion they, they, topic. These, these yellow hands are mind. throwing me off. My, my, I've lost my mojo. Uh, announcements. Really? I've got a short one, and I'm hoping it's not a repeat. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Frank. Yeah. So um, right now, the, uh, the, the Virtual Bridge Organizing Committee here in Portland um, has been, we've been talking with some folks in Australia and uh, India as, as well as in Denver and as uh, trying to encourage them to launch forth and create their own bridges. Ideally, this is, I mean, we're looking at COP26 this year off. There's some possibilities of being able to create kind of a virtual bridge having to do with the People's COP, which is coming up in November. Anyway, one thing that I will share as soon as I, um, I'll, I'll share here on the, um, um, on the chat is we put together what's, uh, what we it's would find that it's comedy that connects me to the human condition, sometimes more sorry. than drama. And um, Pat Oswald, who's uh, one of the best standing comedians, up, has a new special. <laughs> All right, Emily. Anyway, you got, yeah, go, keep on going, Frank. Okay. Anyway, uh, one thing I'll post on the chat here is we put together a bridge kit, which is essentially a, kind of a how-to guide um, for some of these folks that are coming on board. And uh, needless to say, one of the things we're trying to do here is figure out more ways of um, encouraging other communities to put together virtual bridges to not only the cops, because our next COP is in 2021, but also any other UNFCCC meetings um, that we really think that our local communities need to be aware of. Anyway, I'll, hey, I'll find the address and stick that in the chat. Great. Awesome, thank you, Frank. Do we have other announcements?
I was trying to decide if there was, I, I know there's like 10,000 balls bouncing in my area of the world. And I was trying to decide which one of those are announcements. I think the big one is an announcement that Climb Time is going into its third year, the state initiative. Well, there's two things actually. One that Climb Time is going to, into its third year. Um, and we are as part of this work gearing up for a communications campaign. We've been working on it for six months. Um, to be able to get continuous funding afterwards. So we've been thinking really carefully about what kind of products we're producing from the work to be able to filter those back out into our community more broadly, into our legislators and things like that. So it's been a really interesting experience um, going through this. So um, on the Climb Time website, I th there was a tweet, uh, Twitter announcement that went out this morning about it from our communications team. Um, but we're going to start releasing our portraits of projects, which will be interesting for folks, I think, to see. So we're going to be able to go up on the website, I think, this week sometime. And then we'll be like having a Twitter um, pass through of them on the wall climb time. So I'll just stick those in the, the um, feed so that people can see them. Anyway, something to keep your eyes on. Um, and I also heard this morning um, that there are different things moving inside New Jersey around climate science work. Um, and do tell, do tell. Well, some of it is a little bit like difficult to track. So the, the work inside um, local sort of areas and pockets like in the Camden County work um, is is sort of centers of that activity, but there's some internal politics that I guess are challenging to navigate um, that don't necessarily tightly link the whole system together yet. So the more that we can kind of get inside that conversation, it's helpful. So as people are in different locations around the country, like thinking actually about writing letters to political spaces, even as scientists, about how you hope to have better coordination of climate education work is a very powerful move right now. Um, so like if, if us as a community can each individually start to write that and maybe if one of us wants to take the first stab at it and like make a template for that, it would be so powerful from the different positionalities we have to be writing and Frank, you could probably say more to that. But anyway, it's a project that we might want to engage in. So it's a nice segue, uh, Deb. I'm going to take a moment and take off my facilitator hat and put on my announcement hat. But I put in the chat uh, the, um, the uh, Action for Climate Empowerment, building a uh, national strategic planning framework event. Some of you are already registered. Uh, some of you may want to register. Um, but, but one of the, the things we're trying to talk about is, is we don't have a strategic plan for how to do what we are trying to do in this community. Uh, we need a plan. And we're, we're co-opting, as we've already talked about in the past, we're co-opting an international uh, uh, recommendation and a requirement to do just that. Uh, and I think, Deb, you know, you're highlighting one of the structural challenges is the longer we do this, the more we know that the coordination structures, infrastructure, that, that, that builds the knots between efforts and makes the effort uh, come together in important ways is, is almost always the missing key link. Um, it, the projects are great. They don't stay around long enough to really have the impact and they don't do it in a way that is connected to other efforts. Um, and so I think if we can elevate what that means and why and the value and the how and who, um, that's what's gonna happen on August 20th in the dialogue uh, on August 20th as part of this process because we've been elevating that. It's both structures and also funding. The fact that Washington State has been doing this amazing state-driven funding on one piece of our work, which is the professional development for educators at the K-12 level. Um, there's other important educational efforts and, and related efforts that are have to also happen in concert, but at least um, you know, of, of all the states that, that, that chose to do it, Washington State, you guys have done a brilliant job of it. And I think that you've set a very high bar for other states to use and emulate. I know 10 other states are looking at what Washington State's doing and finding it's hard to do in COVID, but uh, it's definitely being looked at as a, as a national model. So, um, but what New York, I mean, I'm sorry, New Jersey would be well advised to strengthen that, but also the coordination function. 
which I know climb time, you guys have been working to strengthen that as well. So sorry, that was a lot. I've now put my facilitator hat back on. Um, well, so and I, I think too, like if you can get, I'm sorry, somebody else has their hand raised, but I'm just going to really and quickly too. on this idea. If you can get more states doing it, even if it's not exactly like the same way Washington does, it's actually good. You can have more models for kind of like how this yep. might work. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Did, who, who had their hand? Uh, all right, let's go. Uh, uh, G Ginger, and then we'll come over back over to Emily. I just have a quick question. Um, when Deb mentioned, you know, writing to legislators or whatever, have, have, has the education community um, interwoven the econo some of the economic arguments, some of which actually have to do with education into why the climate education is so critical? Because I just think the legislators Unless there's some financial reason, I just don't think they really care. A lot of yeah, them. we we are making that case here. That's okay. one aspect of our strategy here, and because okay. we realize that that is there, there's two things that we're we're hitting problems with with legislators and their understanding. And I think this is actually at all levels of the system change that I can see, like our state work, the national work, the international work right. that's going on. So one is that there's a, a gap in understanding about what it means to have climate education. Like the climate education is about broad scale learning for action, right? And the, the education system and, and as Frank said, like the broader sort of ACE pieces of like learning and career technical and all different kind of components woven together deeply um, can intersect with schools in really important ways, but that shouldn't be the only education space that we're talking about. Um, so that's one thing, because when you say the word education in almost every policy space, it gets reduced to like teachers standing in front of the room, rows of students, um, and transmission forms of learning. Radically not what we're talking about, hopefully. <laughs> okay. so, and then the second piece is what you're naming of funding. So we, we are, if people don't understand that first piece, there's no way they're going to put money at it because they don't understand how that weaves in with green economy efforts, with like fostering capacity in the state, with scientific work and like how that's, they just don't see the connections to it because they have a wildly different view of education. So every time you say the word education, make sure you unpack it. And so we're trying to create some, some policy level briefs at the sort of, that sit across these different levels. Um, to help people really say what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about education and thus why it's fundamental to fund it. Uh, Emily, I think you were next. Ginger, are you good? All right, awesome, thank you. Emily? I just wanted to reiterate that uh, I agree with all the coordination pieces and funding needed for coordination. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is, I, I think you'll remember at AGU, there was the invitation for writing the environmental research letters papers. I'm working on a submission for that right now. And like, I don't have a note clearly to say what you just said, but if there's some way that we can cite that in or reference that in, in a sentence or two to reinforce that point, I would like to. So uh, you can follow, you can let me know by email for that. But the other one was that there was a really interesting talk. The announcement that I have there was a talk for the Producers Guild of America this week um, for climate narratives. And I will stick a link in the chat. Um, but if you guys have bandwidth, you guys might be interested in that conversation too. Sure. Uh, Emily, uh, I'm gonna ask Deb. Um, I think the, uh, the infrastructuring and not working uh, work we were doing a while ago in some, some proposal and some talk <laughs> somewhere. Uh, but I think that, that you know, articulating the, the and this, it's, it's, so it's, it's collective impact, not working, and infrastructuring are the three wells of work that refer to this. And there's good literature on all three of those. Okay, so great. those would be the ones, Deb knows the not working and infrastructuring. Um, I would add the, the, you know, obviously Stanford has got the, the work on collective impact that's well known in our community, but a lot of people don't know those other ones as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. And that, that's the kind of framing that we're, we're trying to build into the paper that'll come out for the Washington State work. Um, and it, it's broadly inside some of the things that we've been doing at the national level too. Like really, what is your theory of change and what is your, your 
Um, not your, so it's two things. What is your theory of change for making these things happen in the world? And what is your theory of implementation on getting them to happen? And so those two things going hand in hand um, and understanding underneath all of that is this idea that we're all coming from very different standpoints and positionalities. And because of that, we have to communicate across these chasms of like words, like the word education or the word culture or diverse or inclusion, like all of those words are loaded in certain ways. And so we have to find ways to clearly and the implementation move might be a really clear brief on what this looks like and why to fund it, <laughs> you know, so. All right. Uh, to, uh, Jim asked in the in a chat about the goals for the ACE uh, national strategy. Um, so uh, how, how do I do this? Uh, so I've got there. We're still working on these. They're not public yet, but um, think of it this way, Jim. It, it, the you know we have a slide we've been working on, and it says why U.S. ACE national strategic plan. Why do we need that? What, what would we get from that that we don't have already? And so here's, here's basically the gist of it. Um, it prioritizes public engagement to accelerate a just and efficient transition, right? It prioritizes public engagement to accelerate a just and efficient transition. There's a lot of words that mean something together. It asserts US leadership, right? Because no other major emitting country has made one of these things. Um, it's an international require, recommendation and mandate, but not everyone's using it. And we see, we see in this community value in doing this because it unites our efforts in, in strategy and purpose and also starts addressing some of the fundamental structural challenges we've all been working through, um, namely coordination structures and funding, sustained funding, right? Enough sustained funding that we can do the work that we need to do. Um, it prioritizes public engagement with national and subnational policymaking. Um, that's where that, a lot of that's going to happen. It guides and increases sustained financial investments, um, sustained financial investments, because we've been doing this. It's been killing the community. We go up and down, up and down, up and down. Some of us have been riding multiple waves. Some of us get, get tumbled in the, uh, in the wave and can't come out the other side. So, um, you know, it signals markets about climate priorities because we're able to raise the visibility of a lot of the work that our communities are doing that are important in this space. Defines the shared vision for, uh, for justice in ACE activities. Um, that's a really important part. Uh, that's why we wrote the, the positions uh, for the Clean Network and a lot of other work in that area. It promotes evidence-based approaches to ACE activities because if, if policymakers are gonna fund this stuff, they're gonna wanna know that this actually makes a difference. And they have, we have evidence in our community that these things are actually making the difference that we claim they do. Um, and it promotes inclusivity and participatory process in decision making. These decisions that communities at all levels are making need everyone to be involved in those decisions. And you see communities and governments all over the world where they don't do that and things go really squirrely. Um, and so we are part of that engine. And the last piece is it, align, it, it, it increases alignment and, and self-efficacy among us so that we're able to work more collaboratively and more effectively together um, however we came into the space. So th that's the why. I don't know if that gets you what you're looking for, Jim. There's, there's more slides, but I don't want to chew up all the time here. Just, you, you, know, you like that one, Patrick? So Frank, that was actually Patrick. Thank you. No, but thank oh, you. Oh, it was Patrick. I, I, I was interested too. So that, oh, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. It's something different. Hey, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. It did. Sorry, Patrick. Did you get what you were looking for? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm also curious. Um, a little bit on the structure, though, as far as like uh, the choice of these four sessions, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know everything else you, you could have jumped into. And, and um, after August, what steps come next? Sure. So, so a couple of things. One is uh, we wanted to really run the ACE model, but it, it, we wanted to make it a little bit more customized to our national context. You know, action for climate empowerment is not a driver for why people like anyone on this call do what we do. That's not why we do it. The UN calls for this thing, we, thereby we do it. It doesn't work like that. But 
What's interesting when you start looking at all the dimensions of ACE, you start seeing these interesting interrelationships between training, public access to information, public awareness, public participation, education, and all its forms, taking Peg, uh, I'm sorry, Deb's point, and then also how do we collaborate internationally and domestically? But we change some of those, those groupings just to make them a little bit more aligned with how we work in this country. Um, so that the way this, the quick way we're going to do this is this is rapid. We're moving as fast as we can because there's some key gates that we don't want to miss, right? It'd be better to be good and on time than late and perfect. Um, we don't have time for late. So um, we want to gather as much information from the community, but also begin to grow a community that supports and understands these importance of this, this idea of building a strategy. If, uh, and then we have to take all that input and have a small writing team that we're, can, there's a group of us who are the coordinating team who are building out, who write a draft. We have a group of people who are strategic reviewers and we're building out that, um, who give us feedback on it. And then we come back to the community in October with a community review. Everyone would have access to provide their comments of what did we not get right? What did we capture wrong? What other elements haven't been considered? This is just a framework to drive a national strategy because if an administration in the future wants a, uh, to do what we do at much more impact, you're gonna need a strategy. Also, the United Nations is, is requesting that countries take this seriously and build out these national strategies. I'm acting as the ACE national focal point for the United States. Um, just to be clear, I'm, to, I'm doing this in my official capacity. Um, I am the ACE representative to the United Nations for the United States in the national communications. Sorry, but there's a lot of gobbledygook in UN language. So that doesn't, don't understand everything I'm saying to understand the spirit of what I'm saying. And, and we will go through this process, come back to the community and de derive a framework that does a couple of things. It should show leaderships, not just national, but also governors and mayors and county councils. This is a fractal strategy that you need these elements if you're doing climate action in the United States. You just do. You can't do it without it. It's, that's our position. So, but what does it mean? And that's what we're gonna describe but really what we're trying to get to is um, the next administration that wants to take climate seriously. Are we do we have a process for developing a strategy, a community that's invested in making that strategy? If we do, um, we think the gate that they're gonna want this delivered is at COP26 in 2021. Mm -hmm. That's November, 2021. That means the next administration who's gonna take this serious starts in January of 2021 to run an ACE national strategy process from January 21, assuming we start that early, and that's late January, and deliver something in November of 2021, that's fast. The more we do to prepare for that, the easier this becomes. So this is about preparing for something rapid uh, here. Um, there's a lot of assumptions in all of this. We understand that these are not political statements. These are all strategic statements because we know this is coming one way or another, this is coming. The when is the unknown and that's not something we drive, but we definitely don't want to be going slow when the when starts, we have to go fast. There's no way around that. So um, again, this is all about getting ready for that possibility. And if we are, then, then, then we have to go through a much larger process to engage more communities, more constituencies, more, more important elements um, than we are having. I'll just to be transparent with you guys, the, the indigenous communities, we're really not gravitating with them yet. We're working hard to uh, bring them into this process. Um, we are making progress with climate justice right now. Um, we know gender is a really important element of this. We're making progress there but the indigenous and tribal leaders who are working in the space aren't, aren't part of our space or we're not part of their space yet. And we know we need to get there and that's something we aspire very focused ways. But this is fast. Um, we know it's fast and we're rushing because we don't wanna miss the gate. I feel like a slalom, like you look down the slalom and you're like if I miss that curve, I miss that gate, then if I miss that gate, I miss all the gates. 
I feel like we're, we're trying to hit the first gate to get to the second gate to get to the third gate. Um, hopefully we get to cross the finish line without, you know, losing our skis. That's the plan. Did that help, Patrick? All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how it evolves. <laughs> uh, Are you, uh, you, you yeah. raising voices, folks, yet? To, uh, uh, if you could help us with that, Patrick, we are actively ready to engage whoever. Um, it's been a hard, you know, we've been working actively in lots of dimensions, so we're ready to uh, uh, do that. You just let us know if there's an entry point, please. Yeah, if you, do you have a, a letter that you yes. can provide? Okay, yeah, if you want to send that my way, I'll send it out. Consider it done. Thank you, Patrick. Any other topics that we want to talk about today or announcements? We seem to be chewing up the bandwidth either way. Frank, this is um, Lee Peek at GMRI. Sorry, I'm just on the phone today. Sure, sure. Um, but I just wanted to follow up on that last point also that there's an organization, um, Native American tribal organization emerging here in Maine called the Wabanaki Alliance. Mm. And one of their focuses is on climate change. So I think there's a little opening. They're just getting their act together. There's an opening to kind of um, share the ACE stuff and, uh, and, and maybe get them involved. And either I can do that or I can send you some of the contacts. It may actually be way more interesting to them <laughs> coming from you just in the sense of really being at a national level. Uh, Lee, if you could, if you could bridge, the, bridge us, that'd be great. I will. Thanks, Frank. Sure thing. Others? I know we've got more to talk about today. The, I've, I've got a couple that I, I'm not really hard pushing these. These are just, you know, thinking to what, what going into this might come up. So please, somebody else has something more important. They do it. One actually might be maybe a segue from that other one, or at least tie into that one. So I'm doing it is somewhere we're seeing where, okay, I guess, the, you know, the one is not being political, but just looking at real scenarios, right? We know that. We know what one administration is doing, and now we have what is likely the other most likely administration starting in January. I believe that administration has just come out with, or that, that candidate has just come out with more a picture of what he is currently saying about climate change. And that's, that's something of interest. It's just something to watch that what I mean, politicians say one thing and do another. That's, well, that's some more than others. Sure. <laughs> but but still, politicians do say, this is what I intend to do. And that's important. That's something to look at. And this time, 2008, we had an idea of what who became President Obama did, and a lot of it was carried out, right? So, I mean, it, there's something to that. I, I think there was a lot of emphasis toward clean energy. There's a lot of interest in that. I'm just kind of noting that that's something in the news. And the other one was just in general, we're, we're looking at the whole – you know, national debate about whether to reopen the schools or how to do it and all that. And that's just something somewhere in there to some time to talk about how's that affecting us or what we're doing. And I mean, for one, I'm just concerned about our literal teachers staying healthy. <laughs> that's, that's one that scares me. Agreed. So Agreed. Yeah. anyway, just among the, please, someone else put something there's a, higher. There's a lot of it. There's a lot there. Uh, so uh, any other reactions? I don't want to be the only one reacting today to what Jim said. There's about three different things you could go with off of what Jim said. I'll just pop in. I, I, I did see uh, yesterday, the, I think it was the Grist, Daily Grist had a thing about the Biden uh, climate platform and he does have uh, social justice stuff woven throughout his new updated platform if anybody hasn't seen it. I haven't read the details, but I'm glad to see that it's in there. Agreed. I think it, I mean, one thing I'm watching is uh, the details. I find a lot of these plans are missing a lot of details. Yeah. Um, we've been living these details. Uh, I, you know, as far as I know, uh, our community is not really talking with a lot of the ones when they get into the work we do. Uh, I'm not being asked questions about yeah. this stuff. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hand wavy. Um, and so I think that, you know, this is actually why we're having the strategic planning framework 
because I think we as a community know more about these things um, from our side of the equation, but we've not talked about them together. So I hope that we're able to actually get into those details and explore those details um, uh, for people who care, like anybody at every level, right? That's the point, but also think, Jim, go ahead, Jim. No, well, go, I think I related to that, um, and I know you know this, Frank, because it's been a constant challenge right now, but related to that is like, folks who are working in this policy space, um, like I'm shocked actually at how many people in the policy space really don't have a good grip on what education and learning is. And so um, even folks writing educational policy. So trying to um, change the way that we are informing those folks and build the relationships so with those folks so one of the things that I've been doing lately is I've been figuring out, like really mapping out who is writing these policies, like which groups are writing these policies. Folks like the Climate Justice Alliance, folks like the, the people who worked at the Just Climate Platform, and like reaching out in a somewhat tedious and painful way, um, just reaching out and like peppering them with emails and being like, so, hey, yeah, you're writing this thing and it has to do with my life and like, could we talk, you know? And so, and the lives of like many people who are disenfranchised in this space and hey, I know something about that. And so, so like doing that work, which seems, in, in honestly, it seems in, in many ways very like side to my actual work that I get credit for in the world, but it is, fundamentally what this project is about like how do we actually get it moving and get it resourced and get it like just in in its nature and so i i encourage folks to do that work too and like just kind of bound it because it can end up consuming your life but um you know like i'm gonna do one thing this week i'm gonna try and connect with the climate justice alliance somebody who looks like they're in my space in the world or like would want to talk to me about this and I'm going to shoot them a note and say hey you know and then next week I'm going to follow up on that email like like at that level it's doable and if we're all doing that then we won't hit the problem that I think Frank and and all of us working on the national level strategies are of like not having the collaborations with indigenous networks not having the collaborations with you know black and brown networks and so like trying to figure out how to like get inside the folks like and build those relationships um and and unfortunately it gets back katie i think to the question that we were talking about earlier of like why would they want to spend the time even responding to my email so you kind of got to write your email in a way that's like hey i can do this thing for you you know and this is the thing that i have power in this space to help with and i don't want to do it without your input and thought and like voice like like flipping the script of not like what I need from you, but what I can do for you. Um, and that's gonna be, I think, the most powerful way to get in there. But it's, it's I'm exhausted, honestly. <laughs> like I'm hitting an exhaustion point this week. But, you know, and Frank and I talked about this this morning, but I think it is the, it is the work that we need to do. So the more of us that are doing it, I think it's the better. I think that's a really, important point Deb I think we all know this to some extent like I did you know I did a whole literature review in grad school about how like the communication and education fields don't really talk and and overlap and then you know I think similarly with policy and sort of you know communication education like we all kind of have our silos we live in our networks that we kind of like um work within and um it can be hard to break out of that and 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 i and i've been feeling that too i've been trying to start like think about like how can we try to connect with and and think about those ideas of like what you were just saying like kind of connect with some of these other organizations and groups who do this kind of work in this space that's similar but somewhat adjacent like environmental mm -hmm. justice and climate justice kinds of things you know um, I struggle with a little bit with clean too, because then we get the federal funding and can't do like the advocacy piece that they tend to do. And, you know, so some of those, but yeah, I think that's really important. And I think definitely making sure like that whole messaging and framing of that and this is important for them as well as not just for us. Right. Is really and I think one thing you just named that I, I think is why I still care to like dig in and work in this way is that 
I don't need to do the work of the NAACP. They are way better positioned to do their work than I am, all right? But I do need to know that in the work that I'm doing, their concerns and voice is recognized and owned in the work that I'm doing, right? And so making sure that we are bridging and networking is a move that helps everyone and helps the work more fully. Um, and the siloing that you're naming, Katie, like that's literally what racism is. It's like forcing us into silos in a structural way that reduces our ability to communicate across boundaries and with across communities. And that's the thing that we have to make just that extra effort to overcome. And we're the ones that have to do it because we're generally the ones that are funded better. <laughs> like, yep. So, yeah. Definitely. I'm with you. You know, um, <laughs> there's a couple of other, other, mine doesn't look too grave. There's a couple other gray hairs in here. Do you guys get the AARP? Uh, do you have your AARP membership? You know, they do a lot on sustainable communities and some climate stuff. Maybe we should see if we can get them to start participating in these calls. And I wonder, Frank, if they'd be interested in the ACE work. Because mm -hmm. so, their sustainable community stuff is really, they're really together on that. And so much of it is integrated with climate. So, so uh, Ginger, one, one uh, I'm sorry, Frank, just one quick follow up. Uh, the, 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 the coalitions that have to grow to do an ACE national strategy is much, much larger than the framework development process, right? So mm -hmm. one of the strongest assets we had with the previous administration was we had the convening authority of the White House. You could build those constituencies and those networks and build a really broad, broad group um, because we used it and it worked and it was brilliant. Um, and I appreciate and value it, um, but you're right. You're, but but the getting getting them into the framework versus getting them into the process for actually the plan. I think we're you know, uh, it's today's the 14th. The first launch dialogue is happening on the sixth, uh, under a month away. Uh, so the the but the, there's there's a, a a group and then there's the real group. I think you're talking about a real group representative, absolutely, but. Um, you know, I think that that how we get between here and there is is I th see that more as the second phase because you know there's a lot of work to get these groups to to see the value of joining a already existing effort, um, and you know we are we're not staffed to be successful at that yet. Uh, we're working on it, but but uh, I don't want I value what you just said. I just want you to know that, and it's, you're totally right. I, I want to add not it, it's actually relevant to about three or four comments ago, but doesn't detract from this at all. I hope um, what you're talking about is really important. I just want to make sure that this space remembers as we talk about things we're doing to hit the slalom points and help inform a future administration. I don't know if you're all aware, but for many administrations. I don't even know how many uh, the AMS community has written a transition document in earth and climate science from the speaking on the voice of the AMS community that they provide to an administration and the policy program um, plays a role in that and the leadership of you know the, both the scientific leadership and the council of the society buy into the transition document and provide that so um, that will be happening I'm not very much a part of that right now I saw an early draft and I know that that whole policy that whole process is working in preparation for the next election. Great point, Wendy. So we've got about six minutes. Um, is there anything else? Frank, thank you. Yes. I just wanted to follow up on something I think Jenny, uh, Jenny just was talking about with AARP. There's another group that would be good to link in with as well. Um, and I think more germane in a lot of respects uh, is uh, SAGE, which is Seniors for Generational Equity or something of that nature. Okay. And I think it's a local project, but I'm pretty certain there's a lot of projects like it spread out around. Um, and yeah, and they, ha they have some very definite uh, sort of climate education related 
projects that they're doing here locally. Right. I don't know, again, broad, more broadly. Thank you, Frank. I just wanted to bring up, um, so, hi, this is Tiffany. Uh, hi, so Tiffany. Really quick, kind of the ties with what Frank was saying about all the really important work that's going on so that if and when we hope, oh my gosh, it better happen that Biden wins and we hit the ground running with getting back into the Paris Agreement and all the things that can start lining up with climate education. Um, my daughter's a part of the Sunrise Movement and the Sunrise Movement is looking at the messaging around Joe Biden and around Donald Trump and they're not seeing a lot of differences in terms of why are we reminiscing when we need to reimagine and go forward. So make America great again and restoring the soul of America sound very similar to progressive young climate activists. And I don't know what role we can play, but I feel like there's a youth that is feeling obviously bummed that Bernie didn't win and not very forward thinking when they look at Joe Biden's campaign and the climate action that could come out of his campaign. So I just want to put that out there from someone who lives with a Sunrise Movement person in my house. <laughs> Great point, Stephanie. Uh, I've heard I've heard one of the words that they that that really is bothering people is the bounce back better, because it it sends that like that economy was great. Let's get back to that. And you're like, we know that economy was killing us from a climate perspective, and there was also unjust and unequitable. And you know, so like back is not the right frame. But I hear you loud and clear. Uh, but I think this requires. That's why. You know, everyone being engaged in this process is a critical piece of this this architecture we're trying to design. So, Emily, you had your hand. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. So oh, yeah. the I was hearing a, a couple of you talk about potential partnerships and how to line them up with the the new frameworks that you're developing, Frank. At some point, if there was just a clear structure about where to submit those partnership suggestions so we had a, like a pipeline mm. so that we didn't have to like juggle with them but we had places to send people um uh, i think that that might simplify the logistics i don't know what point. you uh, I actually i think i think i know how one other effort did that and we uh, deb when we were talking about the uh, public health the climate health with the signatories and the coalition. I mean, this is something we, we just haven't had a bandwidth to look at yet, but yeah. I think generally you're spot on. I think that that's something we've talked about. I've just you know, <laughs> not been able to stick my head up high enough to remember that thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and one of the things, Emily, that I think the work this year is about is actually coming up with a really cohesive process for doing that like as yeah. we go out to build the big national strategy um, as opposed to just the framework part of the framework is like how can we snowball survey people to get all these different agencies and linkages and networks like and then social network map them onto the terrain so we can make sure that all of these different components are like represented in the larger framework conversation and are iterated on with different writing committees or different other pieces and so there's some really, really good, um, really good strategies for doing both social network mapping, like so we have a clear kind of live and iterative map of the social terrain of this space. And then like as pushing that out to like a communications portal, like a web space or something and a social media campaign that allows us to be able to have all sorts of people look at it and say, what's missing? What should we add? What are, what are the important nodes? Like, are you connected? And like collectively kind of iterate and develop that, that that's one of the strategies to be able to try and get a clearer kind of landscape analysis. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. So we are, we are at time basically. Are there any other, I, I hate running over because it just, it's just feels disrespectful but man, we have a lot to talk about. So uh, any last points that need to be made today? Any things I forgot? Wow, on the mark, that rarely happens. Uh, we didn't hit the dock today. <laughs> Sorry, that's my old sailing reference. Uh, so let's close it out there and uh, we'll pick it up uh, next week.
uh, where we'll have another ACE uh, dialogue, this time on Empower uh, Community. Uh, what's the topic next week? Uh, it's on engagement. Ah, informal education focused on engagement. That's right. Be well, uh, stay safe, and uh, wear those masks. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Yeah, have a good week. Bye. Thank you, Thanks, everybody.